We made this. Welcome back everyone to a podcast all about the sounds of cinema and discussion about them between the notes, which is where we come in. I'm Tony Black. And I'm Sean Wilson. And this week we bring you discussion of music from John Williams, Jerry Goldsmith, James Horner, Alan Silvestri and more as we discuss the adventure score cinema of the 1980s. I mean... I think after this one, Sean, we might as well just pack up and go home because I don't think we're going to beat this. <laughs> How many great composers did we just cite in that introduction? <laughs> Almost all of them. And we've we've not even talked about at least three or four others who are masters <laughs> that we're going to talk about today. So what we're going to talk about is basically the, the, the geniuses that wrote the soundtracks to our childhood, basically. Well, certainly in it, my case, I imagine it's the same with yeah, you as well. Definitely. Absolutely. Yeah. And... We've chosen five scores each, and I'm sure we could have chosen 50, to be honest. But we've we've nailed it down to five each that we're going to talk through. And this this sort of came about because obviously, you know, now we're back doing this fairly regularly again, at least for now, anyway. As we edge towards the end of the COVID-19 pandemic lockdown, it seems, in the UK. Which means that we will end up starting to get cinema, you know, start to creep back in again and new films coming out. And, you know, the ma- our major cinema chain has sort of announced their reopening in a couple of weeks from when we record. So things like Tenet potentially are going to start to come out and all this kind of thing. So we potentially will have mu- mu- newer music to talk about a bit more, like we did The Five Bloods last week. But, we, you know, I said to you, Sean, I said, what should we do? Let's do something, let's do something fun. And you came back with this topic, 80s Adventure Scores, which is actually something we did. I think two years ago on the previous incarnation of Between the Notes, <laughs> which <laughs> has sort of been lost to the ages because we were playing music and things like that. So we decided to start again. So I, I don't know if we're covering the same music here, but this is just a topic I think we love. And I mean, what you, you sort of mentioned it with our childhoods, but what do you think? Because when we, when we talked about this topic, we were like, okay, well, what makes an adventure score? You know, what what is an adventure score to you and why... Why particularly the 80s? What is it about this decade that makes these so special? I think I was thinking I've been thinking about this in anticipation of recording this podcast. I was I'm kind of curious to know about and the period in which you're born and how that's relative to the films that have come out. So I was born in 1987 and so I I caught the the backwash of the films from um probably the mid the mid to late 80s uh are, are the films that, that I was probably caught up in and I do wonder whether maybe that has got something to do with it. Uh maybe it's the your birth year and, and that and, and its proximity to the year that a, a certain film comes out. But I think in terms of the well in terms of the scores sinking in i think well for one thing the soundtracks have to be in the context of a film that sinks in because the film the film obviously when you're younger the film goes in first and then the soundtrack will inevitably follow uh and i think if you're talking in terms of the films it's the conceptual idea of a film that will sink in at a particular age so one of the ones uh, that you didn't mention in the introduction but which we're going to talk about today is the never ending story and no, i sure think... hang on it's the never ending story <laughs> is its actual it's, title what, what's his face in stranger things is <laughs> walked... <laughs> <laughs> sorry yeah. carry on little musical interlude there but go for it yeah <laughs> well i think um in the case of the never ending story um, I don't want to get sort of get ahead of us actually talking about it, but in the case of that film, it's because it's a movie about the act of reading a book. And I think as a young child, because I've always loved reading, I always love reading from a very young age. I think when you watch a movie that is about a child reading a book, the book then comes to life and the book then starts reading him. That's a really powerful conceit. And I think when that conceptual idea goes in, not only do you buy into the movie, you also pay more attention to the music. And I think it's almost like a, it's almost like osmosis in a way. If you yeah. if you believe in the world of a particular movie, 
then you will believe and buy into and enjoy the music all the more. And I think in a general sense in the 1980s, I mean, I know a lot of people are, you know, a lot of people tend to be quite snotty about the 1980s. The 1980s was the golden period of the live action family movie. I, I, that You can't deny that. You look at the... Um, the way that Steven Spielberg, for example, was not only directing his own movies, but throwing his might behind other movies like Back to the Future, Gremlins and so on. This was a real, there was a real purple patch of really imaginative, high concept family films. Not all of them worked. I mean, it'd be naive to suggest that all of them work. You know, every decade for cinema has it has its bad films as well as its good ones. But the good films in this decade, the family films were so good and they were so imaginative. And I think what that inspired was that inspired the composers to go with the directors and to come up with some really wondrous soundscapes. And we're going to showcase some of them. So I'm really excited about this episode, actually. It's great. Yeah, me me too. You know, it was it was a topic when you said it. I was like, yeah, OK. For all the reasons you've just said, you know, I think there's something about the, the, this music that sort of creeps into your mind as a child. You know, I was born in 1982, so I'm a little bit older than you. <laughs> but I think we, just a little bit, uh, and we we have shared we have we do have shared experiences on a lot of these movies, you know, and and even though there's there's a few years apart, and I think in, it had similar effects on us both, you know, as young young boys growing up in the eighties and nineties, you know, and a lot of these films were were on you know repeat in the nineties on TV or on VHS back in the day, you know, and then into DVD more towards the end of that decade in the two thousands, and they. They they just sit they just soak into you you know whether uh, and and we've chosen different ones you know we've gone for different kinds of styles and different kinds of genres actually and that's one of the things with this we've got everything from fantasy to espionage to good old fashioned sort of tomb raiding action adventure and I think that just shows the breadth of this sort of spectrum of adventure of you know excitement of not just boyhood but girlhood wonder you know that that youthful you know joy of of films and and being swept along on a journey and i think we've i have to say not to blow our own our own horns here not to blow our our own james horner's ear sure but <laughs> i i i think we've 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 picked a belter of a list i really do yeah. Yeah, I do as well. Actually, yeah, I completely agree with you. That, to go back to your point there that you said about um, when films would come on repeat on the television and would then come on VHS, I think what, because um, for, for people of our generation, it's important to note that films took a very, very long time to turn up both on TV and on VHS. And obviously there wasn't this plethora of streaming on demand services that what you've got now. So what you've got, back in you know sort of the sort of early the, the 1990s I mean that's when I started to become aware of because I was born in 1987 so I started to become more aware of things probably from like the early 1990s onwards when a film came on the television it was like an event it was it was it was an actual event and similarly when it then eventually came out on on VHS later to become DVD that was an event as well and you kind of I think that made it easier for films and their accompanying soundtracks to sink in, it made you appreciate it more because you weren't being bombarded with a, you know, a glut of viewing options or different things like that. It was kind of like, okay, I'm going to have to make time to actually, you know, sit down and watch this and take in the various storytelling facets, technical facets, and so on. I think that's, I think that's very, very important, actually. Yeah. And, you know, this was long before the day where you could go on YouTube and you could find all this stuff and listen to them independently, you know. Uh, yes, OK, a lot the, the, they were released on things like cassettes and, and stuff like that and, and CDs, but you, you didn't, it wasn't as commonplace. You know, we didn't have the technology quite to keep in step with that necessarily um, or, or on vinyl and stuff. So a lot of the time we were listening to this with the, with the, with the films. I mean, I don't know about you. I mean, I, I, was, I was a proper nerd. I used to actually... On my old cassette player, I used to actually tape the sound from certain films, certain TV shows, because I wanted to listen to the music, weirdly. Now, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm probably a man alone there, but I remember having a whole, uh, several, almost like my own my own mixtape <laughs> of all of this stuff that was that was music from, I don't know, whether it was Mission Impossible or just whatever it was at the time, just compiled on this cassette. You know, a bit like how we used to have to tape things off, tape movies onto a VHS 
and and sync them up. So you'd have three or four, you could get about three or four movies, well, maybe two movies on a VHS, you get about four episodes of TV. And you used to have to t- sync them. So the one movie would end and then the other one kick in. Just, you have to go to so many lengths to try and listen to this stuff. But I, I, I did, and I think it helped. It definitely used to be in tandem with the movie itself. And I think that makes a big difference. Yeah, I think the, the as we've talked about so many times before, one of the, um, well, the central tenet of film music is that it's not autonomous and that it, it has an identity so much as it's attached to a, a bigger entity, which is the film itself. You know, where, where the film goes, the music will follow. That's not to say that the, mu- the music often won't overtake a movie because in many, many instances, the music actually ends up becoming better than the film itself. Uh, not not in the case of um, I think in the case of all the films we've chosen here, the, the 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 quality of the films and the quality of the music are absolutely in lockstep with each other. But yeah, I think that 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 that's a really really important point actually. That you know, a, 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 the, the identity of a soundtrack is determined by you know, by the context in which it's appearing, and by the conversations between the directors, the sound mixers, the editors, the producers, and so on. But I think that all of our choices today show the magic that can happen when you know when these when these conversations are fluid and coherent and you know when there is clear trust between directors and composers because when that breaks down very often what you will get is is a very very messy um soundtrack situation but fortunately not in the case of, of these examples that we're about to talk about no absolutely not this is where it's all right on the money so as always, we will put together a playlist uh, on on Spotify, and maybe we might link a little bit to YouTube this time. I mean, we, you know, we we we're always mindful of the fact that we we don't want to encourage you know any kind of form of listening that is outside of the you know what the experience of people getting the appropriate royalties and all this kind of thing for music. But you know, YouTube YouTube exists; it is a thing. There is there is music on there, and not everything is on Spotify here. So I think we might have to do a little bit of other linking to get you um, to some of these. Now, quite a lot of you listening will probably know these scores inside out. So you'll be listening to hear us talk about these scores that you love so much. But if by some chance you haven't, and to be fair, there's one or two on this list that I hadn't, I had, I didn't know like for years and years and years and years, and they're more recent favourites. So it's possible that could be the case. Yeah, we're going to put together a bit of a compilation to the list there for you um, as best we can. And... As, as I said last week, if you like the show, if you like the sound of what we're doing, please do first subscribe via iTunes and that will link to all your podcast players if you haven't done that already. And give us a rating. Please give us five stars. Please. Please. We, we, we deserve five, don't we, Sean? We deserve the full whack. <laughs> if you can find it in your heart to give us five, yeah, please give us five. <laughs> yeah, that'd be great. And, 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 a, rate, and, a, and a, a little comment saying anything up to you're great or just liked it fine (laughs) it'll do right yeah Uh, passable passable so on with the show let's kick this off we're going to start with one from you sean and this is a score from your favorite composer one of my favorites and it's not necessarily i would say outside of maybe film score purists his most famous work but you've gone for Jerry Goldsmith's Explorers, which was maybe the first one that you you sort of leapt up and said, "I love this. I want to talk about it." Yeah, because I've I've been playing this um, a lot lately. As as you said, Jerry Goldsmith is my favourite com- um, film composer. I think that that there was so many extraordinary things about Goldsmith's um, compositional abilities, and he's sorely missed in films. Now, I have to, I have to be completely honest about that. This was the. Um, third project i believe that he'd worked on with joe dante uh the um pre- prior to this he'd worked on the first gremlins and he'd also worked on twilight zone the movie with dante because dante handled the post-production and um, sound and music on that so explorers um for those who don't know uh stars a very young ethan hawk alongside a very young river phoenix um and they are um sort of ki- young kids uh, sort of nerdy kids who basically build a spaceship. They build a spaceship in their backyard out of one of those, what they called like tilter world, um, sort of playground, uh, fairground things. And yeah, they build a spaceship and they end up making um, contact with, with an extraterrestrial life form. Now that the film had a very, very kind of 
troubled production as, a, as opposed to Gremlins, which went very smoothly. The ending of this film was the, well, the third act pretty much was rushed and it, it does fall down quite badly when they actually get out into space. But I think, you know, the, the, the film does have a lot of charm and I think almost all of that is down to Goldsmith. And I think Goldsmith's ability to elevate material was really quite astonishing. And I, he was clearly having a good day when he wrote this because you have the... Um, that it all pivots around the main theme, which is presented in the um, the track called the Construction, which is just one of Goldsmith's most wonderful creations. This, as as the title implies, it, it is the scene where you have the group of young pre adolescent kids making a spaceship out of you know bits of four by four and nails and and things, and you have it. There's a sense of joy to the music. Um, starting with the kind of b- bouncing piano that start that starts it off, and then it kicks into this very typical goals with very very commanding use of strings and brass uh mixed in with these synthesized effects that was very another hallmark of goldsmith style the organic synthesized crossover the meeting point between those two things was brilliantly done uh particularly in this score uh, that sense of otherworldly sort of otherworldly magic that he could do better than anybody else and it's just a very it's a very very happy score uh i think it captures the feeling of flight and i remember when i listened to the construction i kind of think well if there was a piece of music that summed up the tone of my childhood, that would be it. Just optimistic, breezy, no no, no real darkness in it. Uh, it's interesting, actually. I didn't actually watch Explorers when I was younger. This was a film that I caught up with in my 20s. And I heard Goldsmith's score. And it was, at, at the point back when I, when I was in my 20s, it was a Goldsmith score that I wasn't particularly familiar with. So it's like retrospectively, it's become... A, a piece of music that I can apply to my own childhood and say, yeah, that, you know, Goldsmith was very clearly in a happy place when he when he composed this. He was a brilliant collaborator with Joe Dante because he got Joe Dante's sense of mischief and humour and also warmth as well. And the the final suite, the Have a Nice Trip, which is basically accompanies the whole like shaggy dog reveal at the end, which yeah, is, 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 is a bit messy, but the music doesn't put a foot wrong and the music just soars to this sense of beautiful resolution is absolutely incredible yeah it's 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 a lot it's not it's not the most famous score that goldsmith did for dante i mean that would probably be something like gremlins but i think it might be the one that's got the most heart definitely i suspect we talked about this a couple of years ago when we did this episode before actually because it was it was familiar to me and i haven't seen the movie actually i it's it's one i need to go and watch but the score was definitely familiar, so I think I think I've heard it before when we talked about it, and it was it was fantastic. Yeah, it's absolutely brilliant, and I, th- I think you've contextualised that soaring feeling really well, and and you know a feeling of going into into space, you know a feeling of sort of starbound adventure. I think he gets, and obviously you know Goldsmith is, uh, was the key Star Trek composer around similar around that time beforehand and afterwards a little bit. And he, uh, well, for, uh, quite a bit actually, towards the end of the nineties. So you know, he's uh, he's played a lot in that sort of science fiction realm. And even though this is a very different kind of texture, and like you say, it's more playful, more childlike. It is wonderful, and he's got a fantastic sort of motif ca- carrying all the way through. You know, this this same you know underlying tune, which is which is just brilliant, and it's very very hummable. Even though not all of it is, it, it's not maybe as thunderously hummable as something like Indiana Jones, you know. But it's it's definitely it gets into your head in a really nice way. And it's very, very uplifting. Definitely. Yeah, it's lovely. And it's, de- it's definitely made me want to go and go and watch the movie, I have to say. I mean, the, the Goldsmith's sort of rhythmic intuition was was astonishing. That There is a video online that's well worth checking out, Joe, Joe Goldsmith Film Music Masters, which actually shows you, it shows him in the process of composing The River Wild, the score for The River Wild. And he, you see him sitting down at a piano, basically going, right, yeah, I, I have my themes, but what I also need are a couple of secondary motifs that I can basically just about two or three notes that I can basically throw around the orchestra that will glue the incidental scenes together. And he was a, he was extraordinary at that. He was better at that kind of thing than than any other. The idea of there there is real coherency, not just in in the presentation of the main themes, but also in the incidental underscore scenes scenes as well. Everything hangs together in that organic synth mixture that he did better than than anybody else. 
And yeah, I, you know, as you, as you know, I can't say enough good things about Jerry Goldsmith. He, he was incredible. <laughs> so. It's understandable, you know, it, he was. And, you know, this is just the tip of the iceberg, really. And he's so, so varied and... Um, but this is this is really does encapsulate that sense of adventure that we're that we're getting at today. So, yeah, if anyone hasn't gone and checked that out, it's it's one we will link to because it's it's fantastic. So, for my first choice, I'm going for a film that I hadn't seen uh, when I was young either, much like you with Explorers. And I saw this film in I think it was 2018 as part of a all night a 12 hour Arnold Schwarzenegger marathon. <laughs> <laughs> and at, at the at the Prince Charles Cinema in London, which I know you're familiar with, Sean. Yeah. And they do they do these fantastic you know all nighters, and I've done a few of them down there. And uh, <laughs> it's it had you know the usual the Running Man, Total Recall, you know Predator, all this stuff. And then it got to about to, it might be I reckon it was about two a.m. And by two a.m. with these things, everyone is flagging. You know, everyone's a bit oh. oh. Because you've then still got at least two or three movies to go, right? But by two, three in the morning, that's that's the wall. That's where you hit the wall. And my wall came for Conan, Conan the Barbarian, uh, <laughs> which was <laughs> halfway through this. Now, I've chosen Conan because I remember, I won't lie, the film is okay. The fi- You know, by John Milius. Uh, it's all right. It's not one of Arnie's best. It's not, you know, the best film ever. But... And, and and because it was two or three in the morning, Sean, I fell asleep. I'm not going to lie. I fell asleep in the middle of Conan. However, I woke up right in the middle of one of Basil Polidoris's epic da, 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 kind of things going on, right? And I was, I was like, wow, this is amazing. Like, I, for some reason, because I think I was tired, the score for the first bit of the film when I was awake... Hadn't really, hadn't really hit me, right? But then I, I was blasted awake by this music, and I was gobsmacked by how amazing it sounded. And I remember enjoying the rest of the film, just listening to the score and things like that. And then I went away and I listened to it independently. And it is, it might be after Star Trek: The Motion Picture, which obviously was scored by Jerry Goldsmith, which is my favourite score. Conan might be my second favourite ever. Because I think this is an absolute masterpiece, and I, I, it's the, it's, it may be just outside of the motion picture. It's the one score that I would love to go. And we've been to, we've been to the Royal Albert Hall and gigs where we've watched your concerts happening. You and I, and I'd love to see see this performed live by an orchestra because it's just. It, it is. It's it's operatic in every sense of the word because the idea with the film was that uh, obviously it, it takes the, the the Conan stories as its basis, and the idea is that it, it's an opera in as much as the film isn't really driven by dialogue. There there is dialogue in it, and there are of appearances from esteemed actors like James L. Jones and Max von Sydow, but. I think there is a real, the impetus of the music is that the music is the dialogue. The music gives its inner voice to the characters. Because let's face it, this was at the beginning of, of Arnie's career when you know, he wasn't, wasn't particularly adept in English. And what you have is, his, it's, it's a movie that relies on the physicality of his performance and the physicality of his fellow actors. And there, obviously there are a lot of scenes, like, ah, 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 ah. There's, a, there's a lot of that. Yeah. There are a lot of scenes where, there's a scene when he falls into the cave, isn't he? And it's prime, like, ah, 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 ah. it goes on for like <laughs> 30 seconds. Um, yeah. But what um, Polidorus does is he he gives that inner voice to the characters. And it's interesting. I was looking up the history of the score uh, before we came on to record it. Apparently the producers wanted a pop inflected score to it. And John Millis went, no, 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 that, that's not going to work. Like, and he stumped for Basil Polidoris with whom he'd worked on Big Wednesday, the surfing film just prior to this, which has got another beautiful score to it. And what Polidoris did was he looked at the likes of um, Wagner and there's there's the, the the Riders of Doom thing, which you know, people compare to the Carmina Burana, the choral thing, which is very, very, very famous and very imitated. And he looked, Polidoris looked to these classical sources and also to very interesting lots like, sort of dark ages instrumentation and rhythm 
and he was able to conjure what what is a symphonic masterpiece. I still was saying to you before we came on, I'm trying to measure in my head which is the better fantasy achievement, the score for this or the score for the Lord of the Rings trilogy by Howard Shaw, and it's very, very difficult. I would say Conan just about pips it for me because what you have is the in Conan, the music by intention is on the front foot. The music is leading the movie, whereas in Lord of the Rings, you have that the score sits side by side with other aspects of the sound design and so on. That's not to say that in Lord of the Rings that Howard Shaw's achievement isn't extraordinary because it is. And certainly there are bits in Lord of the Rings where, for example, in Fellowship of the Ring, you have Gandalf on top of the Isengard Tower and it goes from that soprano vocal into that brutal mechanisation as you come down into Isengard. Remember that, that brilliant camera move? I remember seeing that in the cinema thinking, wow, that's extraordinary, not just in terms of the visuals, but also in terms of the music that Howard Shaw created. So there are moments like that in Lord of the Rings, but I think that principle is consistent all the way through Conan because it has to be, because it, it, it is an opera in which the music is the dialogue. And I was saying to you that I was listening to the Prometheus 2010 re-recording of the score by um, Nick Rain and the City of Prague Philharmonic Orchestra. Both Nick Rain is a really, really good interpreter of uh, scores in the city. Yeah, really, really great. If, if you want somebody to reinterpret a score from 20, 30 years ago, if not older, Nick Rain is, is the man to do that. And the City of Prague Philharmonic are brilliant. And it's interesting because looking at the YouTube comments, it's some people seem to favour the Prometheus uh, recording, which has got a much more kind of richer ambience. And apparently that you can, people can look this up online. Um, if people want to find out more about the history of the Conan score, um, filmtracks.com and moviemusicuk.us, um, which is run by our acquaintance, John Broxton, fantastic journalist. It goes into the ins and outs of this. And apparently what um i was looking at this before we started recording apparently what nick rain in the city of prague philharmonic did was they they did an extraordinary amount of research and they went back to basil polidoris's original manuscripts and they sought to bring out the nuances that unfortunately weren't brought out in the original recording of the score because the original recording has got a, quite a poor sound quality it was mixed down into mono whereas the Prometheus recording is very much in stereo and it sounds richer. But it's interesting, some people seem to favour the claustrophobic mono recording of the original, even with its flawed sound. But the there's no denying that the Prometheus one does bring out, it, it, it's almost like it unearths all of these treasures that have been lurking in this score that we haven't known about for so long. It's 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 astonishing. It's a fantastic piece of work. It's probably Polidorus' greatest achievement, I would say. Mm. Yeah, I think it is. You know, he he made some he made some great scores over the years, but this is something really quite special. And I I did love that uh, Prometheus. You said you sent me that yesterday, and I managed to sneak a listen in. I hadn't heard that recording, and it was yeah, fantastic, absolutely brilliant. Really did pick out certain things. There was a particular track called Wolf Witch, which wasn't I think on the uh, the certainly the Spotify one I, I've, I've I listen to regularly which was really good and a really sort of building, brooding sense of suspense. I, I just, there's just so much in this. There's a real mixture of, of textures. There's, there's the softness, the sweetness, there's the wonderful sort of Wagnerian bombast to it all. And the, I, I just love as well <laughs> that the first track starts with the, the legend from the start of Conan. Let me tell you the story of high Hi, adventure. adventure. <laughs> <laughs> That's brilliant. I love it. Every time I start playing it, I start going from the dawn of the sons of Arius. And I start <laughs> saying it. Love it. But yeah, it's wonderful. An absolute masterpiece. If if you have not listened to this, I mean, even if you don't love the movie, and like I say, the movie's a bit all over the place, but the score, please, please go and listen to this in isolation because it is wonderful absolutely wonderful i mean there were so many themes in it like i was when i was listening yeah. to it again i lost track of the amount of themes so you have the prologue the anvil of crom with the with the, the drum the, the timpani and the, and the brass then it, that goes into the bridge section which is conan's like noble theme that's conan's main theme that weaves its way throughout the score and obviously it achieves heroic status at the end during the battle of the man scene you have the the choral riders of doom theme you have the the atlantean sword theme which i think might be the most beautiful it's mm. got a real like yearning sense of wonder 
so again Va- Wagner is, is a brilliant comparison yeah Va- but it's, he's Wagnerian it absolutely is the idea of, of the leitmotif applying specific musical ideas to certain objects and characters is is really quite remarkable and this wasn't this wasn't yeah. Oscar nominated baffling I think it got a Saturn award or it was nominated for a Saturn award for, for music but yeah that was and it's like how how is this not just sweeping the board like at, 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 at film music like just the, surely in 1982 or 1983 when this was what was this up against like I mean, what I, would this have been up against i mean i think 1982 if memory serves it probably was et i mean john williams with et kind oh, of swept all, right. all before it didn't it but i yeah <laughs> okay. well I mean, it, yeah right. <laughs> it's got i mean i i I think this is better, but I, I, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna stand here and go, "What ET?" No, ET is fantastic, but um, you know, ET could easily have made this whole list, and it's not on our list today, but it could have made it. A genuine masterpiece, genuine, and that word is maybe overused these days, but this really is, I think, an absolute masterpiece. And we could say that probably about most of this stuff <laughs> we're gonna talk about. So, um, I think, I think the next one could be maybe in that range as well. Yours, uh, your second one, Sean, is our first. Uh, John Williams today, and you've gone for Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. So, so the original Indiana Jones trilogy. Let's not count Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. Let's try and just sort of write that out of, <laughs> out of history, shall we? Although, although again, nothing wrong with John Williams' music for that. Yeah, John Williams as ever yeah. doesn't put a foot wrong it's with the film itself. Yeah. yeah. No. So the original Indiana Jones trilogy are kind of, I think, touchstones for anybody who grew up in the eighties and nineties because I remember when Raiders of the Lost Ark came on television. I don't know how I'd heard about Raiders of the Lost Ark, but I remember it being a huge event when Raiders of the Lost Ark came on came on the television. The first time that I remember it coming on television, the the advert, there was like a sort of teaser for it. that uh, They must have been on the BBC or something. And all they showed was that scene in Cairo where Harrison Ford runs from a distant shot into the extreme close-up, you know, before the reveal yeah. of all the baskets. Yeah. That's all they showed. Yeah, yeah. And something went in. Uh, it might have just been the presence of seeing Harrison Ford. I don't know, because I'm sure I probably would have seen Star Wars by that point, probably one of them. But I haven't gone for the score for Raiders Lost Ark. I've gone for the score for um, Temple of Doom because I think it might be the best out of all of them. I know that's a bold claim because... Uh, and I know, you know, I, I might be getting, <laughs> I might be getting ahead of <laughs> something that you might have chosen like, late, mm. later on in the in the podcast. I might be setting <laughs> something up here. <laughs> Even by John Williams' standards, this score is absolutely phenomenal. And it's, it, I know, it, it's, it's saying, it sounds a bit of a cliche. You don't get, you don't get soundtracks like this anymore. And detail. I know I just said this about Conan the Barbarian. The detail, the amount of themes, the orchestral nuances the varieties of texture and tone and pace and tempo and time signatures are breathtaking, really breathtaking. And I think part of the reason for that is probably because because this the Temple of Doom is the prequel to Raiders of the Lost Ark. I think Raiders of the Lost Ark had that kind of um, Christianity, the Ark of the Covenant theme to it, which gave it a kind of spiritual awe, which obviously comes out in the final scene where we find out Okay, it's not so much awe as awful. <laughs> it's kind. Of, it's not. Good. <laughs> it's, it's, it's like the power of God is actually very angry, and the way that John yeah. Williams's score at the end of Raiders twists that is really scary and really well done. But Temple of Doom doesn't have that advantage, so I, I think that because the MacGuffin in this one is that India has got to go and rescue the the magical stones from the evil you know, thuggy cult who rip people's hearts out and obviously lower them into molten lava. It's very appropriate for that <laughs> um, And that obviously, you know, in, along with Gremlins, led to the creation of the PG-13 certificate in America, which was, which was interesting. So I think John Williams recognised that the movie is kind of contradictory. The movie, it lacks the resonance of Rays of the Lost Ark, and yet also at the same time, it's it's more cartoony. Uh, there, there is a much, much more profound sense of, of energy. And that by sort of stripping the Christianity trappings out of it, he has to amp up the energy of it. And he has to throw a plethora of new themes into the mix, including obviously, so you've got the, the Raiders theme is put through all manner of different variations. You've got the theme for short rounds uh which has got they've got the, the asian influence to it you've got a, a love theme for kate capture's character but willie which is much more of a kind of giddy like tongue-in-cheek um love theme compared to the one for marion in raiders which was much more sincere 
and then you've got themes for the bad guys. You've got the, you've got the choral theme for Temple of Doom itself. You've got the thuggy theme, which comes in when you first see the palace, the Pankot Palace. So already, how many themes is that? How many have I started there? About six of them. And and the action sequences. I mean, the, the track that I always gravitate to is the mine car chase, and I just think the 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 flute and the and the string runs on this i'm like how many times did they have to record that in the studio to get that right because this was back in 1984 this is in the days where you couldn't the digitally airbrush things i dare say that probably quite happens quite a lot in film music now but with john with john williams wouldn't do that anyway with john williams everything is organic you know that when you hear a ferociously complicated bit of action music like the mine car chase there was no cheating involved in it that he got that out of the orchestra organically and honestly and what i wouldn't have given to have been in the recording studio when they did that how exhilarating must that have been this is this score it's a masterpiece i do think it's that it's the best in indie score out of the lot definitely i mean it's it's just a, a bevy of of like you know st- uh, music it, it, this this trilogy and it's hard it's hard to disagree really i mean uh, uh, raiders is the the logical and i have to say right you're talking about raiders you talking about Raiders and when it came on TV is a great example of the point you made earlier because that film came out in 1981. You were born in 1987 and yet you still remember when it first aired on television. So that means it's got to be at least 10 years, right? So that, that this, this is what yeah. we're talking about <laughs> in terms of, you know, spans of films coming onto TV back then. But yeah, I, I everyone goes to Raiders, you know, because I mean, the Raiders score is phenomenal i mean we know this we know this we've we've both seen it live it's you know it's fantastic but i think this one i think also because temple of doom gets and it's, i suppose it's had a bit more of a reappreciation in recent years temple of doom hasn't it but for many years it was the it was the lesser film you know it was the when we had the trilogy particularly it was the film that it wasn't as brilliant as raiders it wasn't as fun as last crusade R- temple was the one that everyone sort of went oh yeah it's all right but I think it's had a real reappreciation because it's, it is actually it is actually really good and it's it's pretty dark and pretty messed up and it has a score that reflects all those different shades and it, it, the, the the sheer skill of yeah what what he was trying to do Williams in this he's he's brilliant um, and, and you you I am going to mention another one and I'll, I'll keep it <laughs> I'll keep it see <laughs> it's not Kingdom of the Crystal Skull because that's anyway outside of our remit it's not 1980s so it's, it's one of the other two but I'll keep that under my fedora for now until later <laughs> nice <laughs> <laughs> speaking of adventurers though let's move on and talk about my second one because I'm going to get in the old pork chop express and broadcast, <laughs> I'm going to slip slowly into Kurt Russell and start talking over the Port Chop Express, because I'm going to talk about Big Trouble in Little China by Alan Carpenter. You know Alan Carpenter? He's that guy who makes all those movies about, like, you know, all kinds of schlocky stuff, but I'm I'm old Jack Burton. I'm, I'm all t- <laughs> stuff now. That's actually, that's <laughs> that's actually a really good Kurt Russell in, in me. That's a really good <laughs> Kurt Russell impression. <laughs> I actually thought he was on, well, on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> you're, t- you're you're too kind I, I, su- <laughs> I suspect kurt russell would would have something to say about that actually while i'm talking about it have you, have you listened to the the commentary track with him and alan car and uh, alan carpenter john carpenter for big trouble in little china not only have i not listened to that i've got a confession to make. <laughs> i've never seen big trouble in little china um <gasps> uh, yeah I know. and this is the this is the my equivalent of when you said that you hadn't seen Memento a few weeks ago, right? So I, oh, yeah, it's yeah, yeah. my time to fess up now. It's my time to fess up. <laughs> I, I've I've never seen. I, I like John Carpenter's films. I think the thing is one of the greatest horror films of all time. Should I watch? Should I watch this? And should I take note of the score in particular? Yes, and yes in a different <laughs> way, right? <laughs> um, what? I, so I think really like the the. It's a funny one. Like, I, I, I don't think Big Trouble in Little China would be everybody's favourite John Carpenter movie. I think there are probably better John Carpenter films because Big Trouble in Little China is all about Kurt Russell's truck driver, Jack Burton, who ends up driving into Chinatown in San Francisco in the 1980s and basically gets caught up in, in an ancient war between an evil wizard who is trying to kidnap a girl to um, make his wife an ancient evil wizard who's also a local businessman called David Lopan. Played brilliantly by David <laughs> Just, like <laughs> Just like real life. <laughs> <laughs> Jack Button, he talks like this. Um, he's br- that, that sounds awfully racist, but that's not... <laughs> that, is how he, that is how he talks. And he's he's brilliant. Um, he's brilliant in that role. 
and Kim Cattrall is is, is like a, a a sassy reporter who then helps. You know, her friend gets kidnapped, and Jack's got a friend, uh, a, a friend of his who he's it's his it's his girlfriend who's been kidnapped and he's like this um you know exuberant chinese guy who then partners up with jack dra- drags jack into this and jack is the classic reluctant hero jack burton j- literally he says i just want to get back to my truck like that that's it all the way through and i love the fact he gets dragged on this adventure which involves monsters and goblins and wizards and, and all that. it's brilliant and it all happens in chinatown in the 80s it's so 80s this film and it has a soundtrack by carpenter um which he i think he, he put together with alan howarth which is extremely based in terms of like um synthetics and has a, a has like a, a bit of a, a rock and roll sensibility to it and he's you know he said i, I didn't want a as he called it rinky tink chop suey music like you would get in a lot of films about China. He wanted something that was a lot more evocative. And what you get is a is a real blast of 80s electronica, which is just so much fun. And it, it does have motifs carrying through it for, you know, characters like Lopan, like the uh, the girls. The, who's the girl who's kidnapped? What is her name now? I'm going to look this up. Is it is it Gracie? Um, I, I was looking this up before. Gra- Gracie Law is Kim Cattrall's character. She's right. the love interest who ends up like fancying like Jack, and Jack <laughs> fancies her, but he's always yeah, whatever, woman. I just want to get back to my truck, and she's like, I don't really like you anyway, Jack. It's all that <laughs> all the way through. It's very it's very sort of like Lee Brackett, you know, kind of writing sort of thing. Um, you know, Han and Leia kind of stuff in a way. Now, the, the the girl is Miao Yin. That's her name. The girl is kidnapped, and uh, th- so there's a theme for her as well. And it's just it's just great. It's so much fun. It is extremely of its time, and I think, and as is the music. And I think Big Trouble in Little China was a film that I remember watching when I was very young. I think it came out in '86, and I didn't watch it quite then. I didn't see it at the cinema, but I remember seeing it on t- TV or on video probably when I was about seven or eight years old. And there are certain characters in it that have just stayed with me. Like there's these three sort of wizard henchmen who descend from um, the sky with these massive hats with, with lightning coming out of them. And they just go all the way through. They go, it's going, and just, like, it this, this like, has almost turned into a radio play. <laughs> <laughs> well, I love this film so, so much. And that's why I mentioned the comedy, uh, the commentary, because comedy is a good word for it, because Kurt Russell is the most exuberant and happy man you will ever hear on a commentary. He spends the whole thing, him and Carpenter are clearly good mates still, and he spends the whole thing just laughing at the whole thing. So there'll be a scene and he'll go, (laughs) look at this man, this is great, this is great. He just spends the whole thing joking about how he looks. It It is a joy, an absolute joy to listen to that commentary. I think it's on the Arrow release. But you can tell they had a great amount of fun making it. And it's not perfect. It's it's hilariously daft. But man, is it fun. And and so so and the music is reflects that in a big way. It is very, very of its time. Did you did you manage to listen to the music? And as as an independent person, if you did, what did you think? Yeah, I did I did listen to the music. And again, it's always difficult because as I said, film music isn't autonomous. Film music is tethered to um obviously by its very nature, it's tethered to the film itself. So listening to it on its own terms, I mean it, it did very much sound like you know John Carpenter has has a sound, doesn't he? Obviously it's established from the likes of, of Halloween. And, and escape from New York and things like that. There were many, many bits in this one. I was, I was reminded of the theme from Escape from New York, and yeah, I, I, I found that quote from him that you cited actually about the fact that he wants to avoid um, sort of kung fu cliches in the music. And I think it, fair play to him, he does do that. That the, the rock and roll aspect of it drives it, and I think he did obviously work hard to try and avoid that. It is, it is very much of of its time it is entertaining i mean one can definitely hear how the creators of stranger things obviously had this on repeat in the background while they were writing the script for stranger things they must have had pretty much all of john carpenter's scores on repeat in the background this one in particular yeah i think it's i mean there are there are themes in it it's not it's not just um it's not just sort of ambience there 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 is a construction to it and i i was surprised that there there is the um the song on it which has got performed by John Carpenter himself and Nick Castle, who played the shape in Halloween. Uh, 
which is which is very interesting. Uh, Coup, Coup de Ville, I think, is the name of the, the, the. There are three. I can't remember who the third person in in the group is. But that that's very interesting because that's actually really good. That's actually kind of like rocking eighties, you know, swaggering. But then John Carpenter does have that vibe to me. I saw John Carpenter perform in in Bristol back in twenty sixteen, and I had a really good seat. I was literally sat over his head, nice. so I could see John Carpenter ah, playing the piano, <laughs> the keyboard rather. Brilliant. Um, yeah, and he was he was really getting into. It. I mean, all, let, let's face it, all he was doing was playing a few chords here and there, and then occasionally yeah. like, sort of bopping his head and lifting his arms in the air and spinning around and everything. But he's a good, he's a great showman, and I think that showmanship comes through in this score. It's 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 flamboyant. It's it's synthesized. It's very much of its period. It's very tongue in cheek. I probably ought to watch the film now to to give it its full due. Based on what you said, I definitely want to go and see this now. <laughs> I don't. I, I honestly don't know if you will if you will enjoy it. I I I think I think you would. I think it it is absolutely like many films. One of those things that when you see it as a child, it will always be more magical to you than when you watch it with distance. So hopefully, go and watch it. It is fun, and I I, I do think I do think you'll enjoy it definitely. It is. One of the most 80s things you will ever see. <laughs> it really is. In all the best ways. Speaking of 80s, I would say that your um, third choice is is pretty much of that vein. So you've gone for the never-ending the never ending story. <laughs> Sorry, I will stop doing that. Um, <laughs> which is... Uh, uh, and and uh, I'm going to flip it now, Sean. I've never seen The Never Ending Story. Whoa, really? Yep, yeah, I've never seen it. I'm, I'm really sorry. And um, I think my wife, who's also a friend of yours and you've known for many years, he was shocked to find this out as well. She was like, oh, you've never seen The Never Ending Story? What? So yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, but Sean. Isn't, isn't that interesting? Because cause you were shocked that I hadn't seen Big Trouble in Little China and I'm shocked that you haven't seen The Never Ending Story. Isn't it interesting? It goes back to the point that I made at the start of the podcast, which is I think it, it, it's relative, maybe it's relative to the, to the very specific year in which you were born. I think that that might that might have something to do with it. So I was born in 1987, which probably means that The Never Ending Story would probably have come onto TV for the first time right at the very end of the 1980s, probably probably in the year that I was born, actually. Maybe a little bit after that, 8889. So I probably caught The Never Ending Story when it might have made its second or third TV appearance. And I just remember it being entranced by it as i said earlier it's the idea the idea of a, you know it doesn't just use a book as a prop it's the idea of the young kid bastion takes this mysterious tome from uh, the local bookseller called the never ending story he then starts to read the story it it depicts the world of fantasia which is being destroyed by a malignant presence known as the nothing there is the young warrior atreo who has to stop the nothing from destroying this entire landscape but there's a very very kind of meta twist which is as bastion is reading the never-ending story which depicts the story of fantasia the story then starts to read him and it's a very very trippy it's almost like inception before inception was even coined it's a very very trippy premise for young viewers to get their head around and i think that as i said earlier one of the reasons why i liked it it's, it's a movie about the power of reading and about the power of imagination the the movie actually funnily enough the movie is directed by Wolfgang Peterson who we talked about a few weeks ago in terms of outbreak and it's based on a book which apparently it has very little to do with and apparently the author was the original author was very very annoyed that Wolfgang Peterson changed a lot of the film but let's just assess the film in its own terms on its own terms I think the film still stands up really really well it's not just a commentary on, about the power of reading it's 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 really scary um uh, it's really scary in places. There is the wolf-like um, nemesis called Gmork who pops up at certain intervals. There is the, um, I mean, I dare say you've seen the image of, of the luck dragon, Falcor, the luck dragon, who looks like a dog. He looks yeah. like a golden retriever. Yeah. Um, so the imagery and the creatures and the green screen effects, I think all stand up very well. And the film does have a real charm to it. And the score is actually an interesting thing. Uh, so it's composed, it was a, um, com- originally composed for the German presentation by Klaus Doldinger who'd worked with Peterson on Das Boot, uh the World War II um, submarine movie and then um, when it came to selling the movie to the international market several tracks of, of Doldinger's were replaced by uh, Giorgio Moroder who uh, was one of pioneering sort of electro synth pop uh, composers who won an Oscar for Midnight Express 
And what they did was for the non-German market, they put they replaced, as I said, several of Doldinger's tracks with music from Maroda. They also put the Lamal's the, the Lamal song on on during the opening credits of the film. The German version doesn't actually begin with that. I went back and looked this up. And I looked at the original German opening of the movie, which is just an opening credit sequence with some arrestingly moody music from Doldinger, which sets a very, very different mood. That sets a mood of kind of like foreboding and mystery and excitement, whereas the Lamal song is kind of, it's cheesy, but it's it's optimistic and it's upbeat, as anyone who's seen Stranger Things would know. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. I mean, let's face it, our, our generation got there first. Our generation was watching this film. Our generation didn't learn about the never-ending story because it was riffed on <laughs> in, in, an, in a Netflix series. We, we got here first with this. So, but I think that it, it's, it's an interesting thing that, the big statements in the memorable statements in the um in the music all belong to Doldinger and you've got this symphonic electronic mixture not unlike what Jerry Goldsmith would have done you have the flying theme which is beautiful I mean that that that's the kind of that's the kind of thing that sinks in when you watch the film at a young age that's the kind of thing that sinks in and just doesn't go away just the sort of the joyousness and the energy of it and I think Doldinger's work is beautiful. And, and there, there's an interesting contrast here because one of the um, scenes that was rescored by Giorgio Moroder was there's a scene involving, those who've seen the film will know this, there's the reveal of the um, the ivory tower, which is the, the, the landmark of Fantasia that is basically like the, the last bastion of defence against this evil presence known as the nothing. And in, in that scene, in the non-German presentation of the film, in the international presentation of the film, that was one of the scenes that was rescored by Giorgio Moroder in this kind of electronic sort of manner. I, I actually went back and listened to, to Doldinger's original um, piece for that, which I hadn't heard because obviously I, I, I didn't grow up watching the, the German edit of the film. And it's beautiful. It's really, really beautiful. Moroder's piece is great. It's, and, and, and it's very memorable. I mean, it's one of those, Maroda's theme is one of those ones, again, you remember it from a young age and it makes the hair stand up on the back of your neck because it takes you back to being, what took me back to being like sort of six, seven years old watching the film for the first time. But it was an absolute joy to, to rediscover what Doldinger ha- had in place before Maroda's music replaced it in some aspects of it. So it's kind of a messy, choppy um, soundtrack situation. I don't really know why i don't know why they would have got i understand to some extent why they would have got Maroda to compose and produce the song because obviously they would have thought that like a pop song would sell it more to an american audience but i don't know why they would necessarily have got him to go back and do several underscore cues i can't really understand the intention of that maybe they kind of thought well if we've got him to do the song to presumably get try and secure more of a younger audience to go and watch the movie we might as well get him to rewrite some of the underscore cues as well so a bit of an odd situation mm. i think yeah yeah maybe i i, I think that the, you know there could well have been a, a a a mindset involved of you know trying to tap a certain market with this but it's hard to say i mean i i i, I did enjoy it i have to say you know somebody who's not seen the film like you with big trouble in little china i couldn't place it into the context of the characters and the situations and such but it was very listenable it was very nice it was very it was very enjoyable and obviously you know People like Maroda are, are a very different breed to Goldsmith, Polidoris, Williams. You know what I mean? They, they, he comes from a very different you know, background and a very different establishment of, of style. So it, it did sound different to a lot of the other scores on this um, that we've talked about and we'll talk to talk about. It. But it, it, it was lovely. And I, I just feel like it's, it's one of those... <laughs> There's a bunch of films that I've got that I just can't believe i've never seen and this is one of them <laughs> <laughs> yeah. to be honest, i just don't understand why i've never got there the, the score the doldinger score is beautiful and i think having listened to it in isolation this was the first time i actually listened to it in isolation outside of the film i heard it several times within the context of the film itself i hadn't actually heard it on its own terms it's really really good the themes in it are very very beautiful and the, the Maroda, i suppose the Maroda tracks with the exception of his his take on the ivory tower which is really really good his other tracks are kind of ill-fitting kind of like sort of again sort of synth pop synth rock rhythms which you know it's almost kind of it reminded me a little bit of what um what Ridley Scott did with Jerry Goldsmith's score for Legend which was obviously a a notorious case of a complete breakdown in communications between director and a composer because with Legend Jerry Goldsmith scored the European 
cut of that film. It then went over to America. They threw Goldsmith's score out and they replaced it with Tangerine Dream. And that is one of, one of if not the most notorious instance of, of, a, of a composer being very, very badly treated by, by the director and by the producers. I, to my understanding, I don't think there was that level of acrimony on the never ending story. Uh, again, for the most part in the film, it's, it's Doldinger's music. Probably about 80% of the music is driven by Doldinger's music, which I don't really understand why they would have got Maroda to come in mm. and do the incidental cues. I, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't really, I don't really get that. But, you know, either way, I think the soundtrack large, largely coheres. I think it's, it's a very enchanting experience. Yeah, it was, it was lovely. It was lovely. And I, I will go off and, and watch the, uh, the story that never ends. Although, that, that, always, that always amused me when I was going. I was like, "Well, surely it's still going on. Like, <laughs> it's a never-ending <laughs> yeah. story." Yeah. Um, but yeah, my next choice is my third choice is uh, another film that <laughs> this is becoming a bit of a theme in this podcast. It's another film that I fell asleep to at three a.m. <laughs> during a uh, during a twelve-hour tw- binge. In this case, it was at the Prince Charles Cinema again, and it was a all-night Bondathon, James Bondathon, and it got to about three a.m. and that's when because what they were doing, they were going chronologically by Bond. So we'd had a Connery film, we had On a Majesty's Secret Service, which was the Lazenby film, we had a Roger Moore film, and then we got to Dalton, to Timothy Dalton, and the film in this case was The Living Daylights, which is scored by John Barry, and this was. It was about three a.m. and I confess, <laughs> I didn't finish. I didn't. I didn't manage to stay awake for the whole thing. I mean, it wasn't the first time I'd seen The Living Daylights. I remember watching The Living Daylights when I was a kid, and that came out in nineteen eighty-seven, and it was the first of two Timothy Dalton Bonds. And I, I didn't watch it at the time in the cinema because I was a bit too young. And my first Bond in the cinema was Goldeneye. But this was, this has never been one of my favourite Bond films. But I. I wonder if it's maybe outside of Honor Majesty's Secret Service. It might be for me, John Barry's best, actually. Because, and that is saying something, because John Barry has scored most of the great, you know, Bond movies um, in terms of, you know, up until this, and this was his last one, 1987. But I think The Living Daylights is fantastic. It's got some beautiful beautiful tracks in this i mean it, it it's oh it's it's got a, a real me- measure of john barry sweeping orchestration in things like you know oh what's the name of the what's the name of the track it's the one where the, he's, they're in afghanistan the mujahideen i think i think something like that um and it, it's it's a beautiful sweeping melody and then it's got a lot of the very sort of late 80s almost sort of electronic things going on, particularly tying into the theme from Aha, the classic, the living daylights. And also the the sort of secondary theme by Chrissy Hind, which was... Um, uh, where, 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 where has everybody gone? Yeah. Where's it? Where has everybody gone? And in the, particularly, there's one sequence where a uh, <laughs> classic Bond fashion, a milkman, <laughs> a milkman terrorist <laughs> uses milk bombs... <laughs> <laughs> to attack the home of M, the head of the Secret Service. Yeah, the character of Necros, isn't it? Yeah, Necros, Necros. the assassin. Yeah. yeah, who has the brilliant fight on the airplane at the yeah. end with Bond. <laughs> it's, the, it's that brilliant. It's it's almost like they stumble into the 1960s Avengers show in that whole sequence. It's really eccentric, but it's got a brilliant sort of weaving in of where has everybody gone into the, into the score. So it's got a real measure of those... Those aspects and Barry's real skill of managing to weave in the actual title track, whoever whoever sings it, and he did it brilliantly with A View to a Kill, which was the film before this from Duran Duran, which again was a very 80s style tune, and he manages to weave it into the texture of, of the score. And uh, it was his last Bond score. I don't think it's quite his best, but I, I included this because, and I love his scores for Octopussy and A View to a Kill, which were both also in the 80s, but I don't know. I, I don't know about you, Sean. The Living Daylights just pips it for me. Yeah, I think it's his best Bond score, along with oh, Her Majesty's cool. Secret Service. And yeah. I put it up there with On Her Majesty's Secret Service and Goldfinger. I think it's a masterpiece. And I think you've highlighted exactly the reason why. Because John Barry was better than anybody else, as you said, at adapting song themes into underscore cues. 
And I think the real advantage that the Living Daylights has got is that there are several songs throughout. So like you said, you've got the AHA um, opening title theme, you've got the Pretenders theme, and then you've also got the um, the, the, the um, closing theme, the, the end credits song, uh, which I believe is called If There Was a Woman, which kind of gets overlooked. Yeah. That's, the lo- that's the love theme between Bond and um, Cara, Marion Diabo's character. So what you have are basically three theme well three main themes and then obviously on top of that you've got the bond theme itself which is as you quite rightly said is put through all these kind of electro synth um variations to bait to show to, barry is basically telling you that timothy dalton is a different breed of bond he's harder edged he's grittier this is a late 80s bond he's he, dalton is taking it seriously as let's face it roger moore hadn't done that for quite some years before this yeah, um, true. and the way the, the way the music is is signifies that is brilliant the way the music pulls you in with these different textures is really really good but it's also got a really strong thematic base all of those themes from the songs that i've just cited are repeated very very regularly throughout the scores there is a real rich coherency and intermingling of ideas that are all communicating with each other you've got some some fantastic action sequences barry wasn't necessarily known for doing action music even though he was the bond composer i mean a lot of the bonds themes were almost in a way quite lethargic i suppose if you think of something like moonraker uh, moonraker is always an interesting moonraker is scored in a very very languid style for the most part despite the fact that it involves you know space lasers and rockets and, and you know an evil fiend trying to take over the world but there is a real sense of energy to the living daylights not unlike a view to a kill as, as you said it, it's it's an incredible score and what a what a high note for barry to go out on it's brilliant i mean you think of tracks like um hercules takes off which uses the living daylights theme and applies it to an action context barry was so good at that at identifying okay so we, we've got this song with, with this particular sort of thread underneath it at what point can i put that in the in the film he was really really good at that i believe i read a quote that Jerry, even Jerry Goldsmith basically was was in awe of how John Barry was able to reinvent himself with the Bond um, films, and Barry was very pragmatic about it. He there's a quote from him where he said that it's just basically million dollar Mickey Mouse music. That's that's all it is. <laughs> I, I I think Barry it's... cited other scores that he'd done as being of of greater value than this, but I think this Living Daylights is tremendous. Yeah, I mean he he might well go for things like, I don't know like Out of Africa, which was a few years before which was sumptuous you know and things like that but i think he's i think he's he probably undersold a little bit of the majesty he did with the bond scores and i i mean i I suspect sean that you and i will do a bond episode closer to when no time to die comes out later this year and i think that'd be a good idea and we will probably talk more about john barry then i would i would guess and everything but yeah i think this is this is a fantastic piece of work. One of the gems amongst gems, really. And and and, and uh, if not my favourite Bond film of the 80s, might be my favourite Bond score of the 80s, I think. So, yeah, I, I had to throw that one in there. We're going we're gonna, to uh, travel back, Sean, for your next one. A couple of years to 1985, uh, <laughs> to what might be the, the most signature movie of... The entire decade, actually, and probably the film that when so if somebody was to say to you, name a film from the 1980s, I think they would say Back to the Future. Yeah, I think Back to the Future is one of those like rare, flawless movies. You wouldn't change anything about it, would you? There's, there's, there, there isn't a single thing that's out of step. Everything in it works. The direction, the screenplay, the performances, the music by Anne Silvestri that we'll get onto in a minute. Yeah, it's, it's so... The movie... Obviously, it was the first part of a trilogy, and it's easily the best one out of the three, although I do really like part three as well, the Western one. It, the first Back to the Future is so, it's so good natured. It's so good natured, despite the fact that, you know, in classic 1980s fashion, it was, it was dabbling in areas that are quite clearly beyond that of the target audience. I mean, the idea that, you know, you go from the 1980s to the 1950s and you're then hit upon by your own mother. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you think is, of it like that. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's quite and it's, it's quite it's very risque for for you know yeah. for a PG rated film. But again, movies in the nineteen eighties had guts. They they really did have guts. I mean, figuratively and also literally. In the case of Temple of Doom, they actually did actually have guts. So films from this period, as as we said at the very beginning of the podcast, were very audacious conceptually, and what this inspired. Um, 
Robert Zemeckis inspired composer Alan Silvestri in their second collaboration because they'd worked together before on Romancing the Stone. It inspired Alan Silvestri to come up with, yeah, as you said, one of the defining symphonic masterpieces of the decade. It's interesting that uh, looking again, looking back into doing some research for this um, before doing this podcast, Steven Spielberg produced Back to the Future and having heard Alan Silvestri's largely electronic score for Romancing the Stone, he didn't have faith that Alan Silvestri would be able to do justice to the canvas of Back to the Future. And he, and at, at, at the request of Steven Spielberg, Zemeckis got Silvestri to do a score that was big, you know, that was an orchestral score that was big. I believe at the time that Back to the Future was recorded, it was the biggest orchestra ever assembled for a, for a film score. And it was just kind of like, you know, impose yourself on the production, elevate it, bring that sense of joy and fun and energy. And obviously that comes through in the main theme, which even though even people who don't necessarily follow film music will know what that theme is, which is, I think, a a really fabulous example of how an orchestral symphony can kind of break down boundaries and can transcend attitudes and it just it just embodies the spirit of the film so well through its through its sense of just warm-hearted optimism and energy and fun and that that theme that i mean it's it's really a one theme score that that is really the main thing that underpins the whole thing but that's not necessarily a bad thing because what that does is that there is there is there is a kind of coherency to the score and it's all about the the, the out the um the standalone presentation of that theme kind of gives you is like the overture of the film but then throughout the course of the movie itself it's kind of right how do we break that down and fragment it and use bits and pieces of it in certain scenes to convey for example the heroism of marty mcfly's character michael j fox how do we um put it through all of these extraordinary variations during the clock tower scene at the end which is you know the, the the brilliance of Suestri's music in that particular scene is it's both funny and also really really tense at the same time, and the 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 level of detail in the orchestra, the way that the, particularly if you listen to it on its own, the, the the dialogue between like the the tubers and the bassoons and the piano, the way it's jumping around all over the place to to get the. the it, what it does, it brilliantly depicts the kind of manic physical movement of the characters on the screen. Because Michael J. Fox and Christopher Lloyd playing Doc Brown are so brilliant in the film. They've got such, they've got such a command of physical comedy, and the way the score recognizes that, and the way the score leaps around with this sense of like almost like zany energy, but not in an annoying way, in a way that absolutely serves the story and is very very listenable on its own terms. It's just, it's just brilliant, and it obviously, it, it mean it. For many, it remains the the highlight of Silvestri's career. It set him on course to go and write not only the other two films in the series, but also the likes of Predator, Avengers, Forrest Gump, you know, Volcano, uh, and all 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 the Judge Dreads. All of these great scores kind of stemmed from Back to the Future. This was the point where Alan Silvestri properly arrived on the Hollywood scene, and I think that it's it's no surprise that you've got programs now like Stranger Things, which do definitely you know all that all 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 that strange things has to do is point towards the back to the future theme and automatically you're there you are you are in that period which I, if that's not a testament to the power of the music then i don't know what is frankly yeah i i think that's it, it it's extremely evocative and i think it, it it's there's a there's an iconic level to i think back to the future that you know probably that rivals something like you know indiana jones i think really um uh, and, and I think you know, even with all the great stuff we're talking about in in this in this collection of music, I think really Back to the Future and Indiana Jones are the two pieces of music from the eighties. More than any other, I think, are the ones that people would know and would be able. A bit like how they know the Superman theme, you know, from the late seventies and into the eighties. To be fair, they know they would know they they'd be able to hum Indiana Jones and they'd probably be able to hum Back to the Future. So yeah, I think um, I think it's great. I love I love it to bits, and the influence and the reach of it has been astonishing you know um it, 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 even for Silvestri as well you know it's, it's amazing to think actually that Alan Silvestri goes back this far <laughs> in yeah. a way and that he's still you know I mean he, he just last year he he scored like Avengers Endgame which was the biggest film of 2019 and had some fantastic stuff in it actually some really beautiful pieces of music 
to think that he, that's nearly 35 years later and he's still doing that stuff. It's amazing, really. Well, it's it's wonderful because in recent years, um, what you've got is, for example, the directors of, of Avengers Endgame, Joe and Anthony Russo, the fact that they, they recognise that Silvestri is one of the last bastions of the rousing symphonic orchestral film score. They they obviously recognise that and they've brought him back into the fold. Silvestri is now a veteran. I think he's in his 70s, like late 60s, early 70s. And the fact that you've got this new generation of filmmakers who are who are deliberately looking back to these composers who defined the sound of the 1980s, they thought, right, we want that sound in our film. We want we want the person that defined that decade musically on our film in 2019. That's brilliant. I mean, I, I, you've got to give credit to any any filmmaker that can recognise the integrity of a composer like that. They they deserve yeah. just as much of a shout out as well. For sure, yeah, yeah. And 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 a lot a lot of these a lot of these films these days do owe a debt, I think, to that era of of cinema. These big adventure films, these big spectaculars, absolutely, you can you can feel that they the love of of those films. I think they would also owe a debt to my next choice, my uh, penultimate choice, which is going back to the well of uh, of John Williams, as we hinted at before. And I, I'm I'm going for the Last Crusade, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, because I think this is I think this is the score that I've always enjoyed the most and, I, and like, no, like we talked about earlier there, there is a probably a strong argument that Temple of Doom is the best but and you know Raiders is probably the most beloved in many ways but I, I just I love The Last Crusade I love it it's my favorite Indiana Jones film so maybe that's one of the reasons that I find the score so enjoyable you know tracks like es- Escape um, from Venice you know where on, on the gondola the, the whole um, Scherzo on the motorcycles Scherzo for motorcycles I think it's called where Indy and Henry are uh, in the in the motorbike and sidecar you know running away from the Nazis there's so many like, there's so many in this in this film even I, I even love like the I don't know if it's on the um, if it's on the actual soundtrack but I even love the slow sort of building drums when you get the sequence where Indy and I can't believe this is in the film actually when I think about it the sequence where Indy literally bumps into Hitler and gets him to sign his dad's <laughs> holy grail book like, when, I, when I think back and I think actually yeah Indiana Jones actually does bump into Hitler in that film but that's that's it in Berlin that sequence is brilliant it's just these slow building drums that are very evocative of sort of Nazi Germany and it's it's little it's little things like that in this score that I just think are, are wonderful and I, I think it's it's got and it builds obviously to the final you know sequence with the Grail Knight and you know the chasm and walking out and all these all these things I'm talking about are, are again like films like Back to the Future are so you anyone listening I'm sure can visualize these sequences in their mind you know and 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 it will transport you back to what I think is one of the best films ever made actually genuinely think that about Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade I think it's wonderful. And it's it's probably it's up. If somebody said to me, "Name your top three films in terms of pure bliss and enjoyment," this is in there, hundred percent for me, anyway. Um, so yeah, I just I, I get a kick out of this score, and and I, and also not forgetting Indy's very first adventure, that like ten minute opening sequence, which goes back to like the nineteen tens, and he manages to make it sound like a western. Like it's and it's it's just brilliant. Like the whole thing is just so varied and texture and full of different textures. I love it, Sean. I love it to bits. It is. It's wonderful. It's. It's. I think it's easily the most good-natured of all the Indiana Jones films, and therefore John Williams' score is the most warm-hearted and, in many ways, most intimate out of all of them. Because it, it's not. Although the movie does have the Holy Grail in it, the real Holy Grail is the relationship between father and son. That's the whole point of it. That that is that is what is being attained here. So it doesn't have the kind of. It doesn't have the the, the menace and freneticism of, of Temple of Doom. It doesn't have the kind of grandiose spiritual turning into horror overtones of Raiders of Lost Ark what it does have is a real a real sense of kinship and and compassion even even though as you quite rightly said it is it is a big great big adventure score but that's how brilliant John Williams is the way that John Williams is able to to locate those specific tones within within the the kind of the globe trotting you know nazi punching indiana jones franchise the, the john williams ability to reinvent himself is really extraordinary it's really quite remarkable you think that you know across the course of three films you think well okay you know all three scores are probably going to sound quite similar no, no absolutely no, not no. and not i think actually the, the funny thing i don't know if you've seen it there's um as a sign of how much john williams has broken through into popular consciousness 
there's there's that gag on um is it family guy when uh peter griffin puts on the opening sequence of indiana jones and the last crusade and he basically hums along to <laughs> to the john williams <laughs> track for the best part of a minute and a half have you seen that amazing i haven't no i need to go watch that <laughs> he's like <laughs> and and then um I, I think it's i think meg um amelia Kuz's character uh, cracks yeah. open like a can of coke and he goes, oh, seriously, Meg, that's so annoying. <laughs> I, 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 I think that's how it works. That, that is, I mean, Seth MacFarlane has got a, a real love of film music. That's one of the reasons to like Seth MacFarlane, actually. But the fact yeah. that he put he uses John Williams as the basis of a joke in Family Guy, but not just John Williams, a very specific John Williams track from Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade shows how brilliant this score actually is. And it, it's, it's wonderful. I, I, I think that, one of the interesting things about this score is the way that it's much more reticent in the way that it uses the Raiders March, the main theme, which was all over the place in, in Raiders and Temple of Doom. But in this, it's kind of like, right, we have to earn the right to use that. We have to use fragments of it only at key moments, which makes its eventual appearance all the more powerful. That I, that is important. I think also the, the general bucolic tone of the of the material between Henry and Indy, the way that that the way that 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 there's almost like the Grail the Grail theme is kind of split in half. You have the very mysterioso noble theme for the object itself, and that then there's like a B there's like the B variation of that, which is the spirituality that exists between the father and son relationship. So the way that that all comes together is is very very well done. The action sequences are brilliant. I mean, even even if they are, for the most part, more lighthearted than they were in Raiders and certainly more lighthearted than they were in Temple of Doom, that there's a kind of frolicking whimsy about them. But when when Williams does get serious, because obviously there is always a point, there is a point in The Last Crusade where the stakes are raised and it's kind of like, right, okay, we really need to stop the bad guys from getting their hands on the Holy Grail because this is bad for like mankind. And the, the belly of... The, there's um the, the tank chase sequence which somewhat frustratingly was split into two separate pieces there's a piece called on the tank and there's a piece called belly of the steel beast someone really needs to edit those those bits of music together to present it as you to present the music as you heard it in the film because that's one of john williams's best action scenes and that is really exciting it's really well done it's really dramatic it tells the story i mean you, you can see the scene in your head even if you're not watching it and just playing the music on its own Every single interval and time check, time signature change and tempo change and the shift from the snare drums to the brass to the strings and back again communicates what's going on so magnificently well. And just Williams' ability to do that, like Jerry Goldsmith, is just phenomenal. I, I can't fault your choice of this. I think it's 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 a it's a brilliant score. Even despite what I said about Temple of Doom, this this is a mm. phenomenal score as well. It, it's just very different. And I, I think, you know, in terms of actual skill, I think you're probably right about Temple of Doom. But I think in terms of emotion, I think I think you've hit the nail on the head. And I think the, the bit that you're right, because it is very breezy and it, there are lots of lots of the action scenes are very much, you know, things like Sean Connery going, oh, they don't come any closer than that. You know, that kind <laughs> of stuff. I just remembered my Charlemagne. <laughs> yeah, you know, all <laughs> Sorry, these I kind of Sean things. Impression. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we had to do it. Yeah, uh, Ming Ming Dynasty it breaks the heart. You know, all this stuff. So there's, Junior, there's lots, there's lots. Inertia, Junior. Junior, yeah. <laughs> there's just so much comedy about the action. But then, when the bit that gets me and chokes me up is the bit where, at the very end, because obviously, like you say, the stakes are raised. Henry's been shot. At the very end, though, where India has the choice between the going for the Grail and his dad's holding his hand, and he just says, "Let it go." And the music is just beautiful because it's the mo- it's the point that it becomes like serious and emotional. It just lifts up in this soaring way. It's gorgeous. It's gorgeous, and it's and it, it like you say it's it's so worth it. Then when you get to the end of the whole film, where you get the march and you get the full indie theme, it's rousing, you know. And yeah, I, it, it's wonderful. I love it. I love it to bits. Absolutely love it to bits. So your final choice, Sean, we've got two more. Your final choice is, um, we, we, it's about time we got some James Horner on this episode. So you've gone for uh, Willow, which is is one that I'm not as familiar with, actually. Again, it's a film I haven't actually seen, which probably shows that it's my fantasy. The fantasy aspects for me are the ones that I, I think I'm less often invested in. But this score is pretty great. Yeah, I mean, this was another film that, on constant rotation on 
on the TV in, in my house because we, we recorded it onto VHS. I watched Willow so much when I was younger. It's one of my favourite fantasy films. So are you, in terms of the film, how, how familiar are you with it? I'm not. You know, not, I don't think I don't think I've ever seen it. No. Okay. Um, so directed by Ron Howard, so sort of and d- devised an idea that's devised by George Lucas, and the, the movie uses um, special effects from Industrial Light and Magic, which is obviously George Lucas's company that he formed during the making of the, of the original Star Wars trilogy. So high fantasy movie starring uh, Warwick Davis as Willow, who embarks on a quest to save a young um, baby called Alora Dannon from an evil witch. It, it's prophesized that Laura Dannon will grow up and throw over the evil queen. Bav Morda, played by uh, Jean Marsh on like fiendish, like scene stealing form. And uh, along the way, Willow has to team up with the likes of Mad Martigan, played by uh, Val Kilmer. And it's a good, it's just a sort of typical, like, sort of George Lucas era fantasy film. It's full of swashbuckling, you know, sort of, you know, memorable characters. I think it's a great film. I think it's, it's definitely, it's beloved by a very, very specific generation of film go, I think. And I fell right into that. The movie came out in 1988, so the year after I was born. So again, this is kind of to make that point again, that I think that the year that you're born is relative to when films sink in or not. And uh, it's, 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 a, it's, a cra- it's a cracking, I think it's a cracking film for what it is. And James Horner's um, score was is one of several that he did for, um, for Ron Howard. I think prior to this, he, they'd done Cocoon together. And it's it's a classic sort of James Horner sweeping melodramatic fantasy epic, albeit a very very controversial one. Because as always the case with James Horner, <laughs> there are quotations of other composers' works that are basically interpreted into the score and then passed off as pieces that James Horner did himself. I'm just looking it up again. I'm looking it up um, in terms of if anyone wants to find out more information about this movie music UK US. Um, the reviews by John Broxton and others are very very are very very good for this so there is there is a quotation from a composer called Robert Schumann who wrote um a, a, a symphony in 1850 called the Rhenish Symphony number no. three and that, that that that's just one example of right okay that is very obviously when you hear the Willow score that's quite obviously a piece that was divide, devised by somebody else in the 19th century that's now being interpreted into the fabric of James Horner's music um obviously when you're younger you obviously don't pay any attention to that at all the music just kind of washes over you in this spirit of adventure but then when you get older and you start to pick it apart you think oh, okay I can kind of understand why Horner generated a lot of controversy in some circles but if you get around that the score is beautiful. It, it is a fantasy score. There are, like Conan, there are themes that are applied to specific characters. There are themes for Willow. There are themes for Laura, Laura Dan and herself. There's the theme for Mad Martigan, which is you know, redolent on the on the brass section. Uh, there is the infamous James Horner four note danger theme, which he used in pretty much all of his adventure scores, like da la da, like that that thing. Uh, it's the one that you hear right at the very beginning of Avatar when they're approaching Pandora for the first time. You hear it there. Uh, so it, 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 to some extent, it is it is James Horner on kind of sort of self referential magpie form, but the music itself is so beautiful, and it uses I believe it's the Westminster Boys Choir. I might be mistaken about that, and the London Symphony Orchestra. So it's a proper full blooded symphonic experience in which the, the idea is that the, the music propels the action forward this is not a score that sort of sits back it is a score that is meant to enchant you it's it's meant to be beautiful it's meant to be terrifying at certain points and indeed it is it's meant to be adventurous and it's a very very important factor in the film like like john williams with indiana jones and star wars the um the music is probably at least 50 60 percent responsible for the for the impact of what you're watching and it's 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 a really really i think it's it's a lovely it's a lovely score because i only have to listen to a to a few bars of it to be taken back to when i was i don't know 7 or 8 years old and watching the film for the first time on the telly because i didn't see it when it when it came out in the cinema because i was only 1 year old at the time but it, it, right from the opening um right from the the opening scene of willow where you've got the boys choir which gives this kind of eerie almost foreboding sense i just need to hear a few bars of that and i think okay that's the theme from willow that's the theme that i remember opening the film and casting this kind of fantastical air of like portent which james horner did so well so this is a score that would probably 
really split opinion down the middle if you were talking to classical purists <laughs> it's, it's symphonic yeah. purists, but i love it yeah it, it, uh, without knowing all that detail yeah i mean i'm, I'm just as a, a, a you know on the face of it it's a, it seems like a great fantasy score so it's it's again a film i should have seen but it, it's clearly that like fantasy isn't my normally my bag um but it, the, it's definitely it's definitely the case that you know there are there are some amazing scores what year was this? Was this about nineteen through eighty three or? It was eighty eight. This, this was eighty eight. So oh. this was this was late eighty. So this was after Star Wars had been resolved, and obviously George Lucas. George Lucas wasn't interested in directing at that point. What George Lucas was interested in doing was backing or well, devising concepts and and backing up other directors so obviously george lucas devised the character of indiana jones with steven spielberg but he didn't direct any of them similarly with this this was an idea that he'd had that he then threw over to ron howard but it was it was a lucas film production uh the idea that you know it was george lucas's might and his sort of prowess with visual effects that kind of gave willow the, the residual personality that it did. I mean, you wouldn't look at it and think that it was a Ron Howard movie because, I mean, let's face it, Ron Howard has only done a, a few fancy films throughout his career, but it's very much in that kind of George Lucas, Spielbergian late 80s mould, you know, with sort of operatic villains and char- heroes that you really like and a, a big full-on orchestral symphony that's not backwards and coming forwards and telling you what to what to feel at certain points i think it's cracking yeah yeah yeah. it is really good it is really good and i, I need to go and fill that film uh spot in my filmography um as i do <laughs> actually the last film i've chosen which i haven't seen <laughs> not but, advice, so that's all right <laughs> that's okay but yeah. uh, and <laughs> so i'm not on my own here but i included it because i remember hearing a compilation uh of this on youtube Somebody had put together a, a, a soundtrack, sort of 15, 20 minute compilation, and I fell in love with it. And it's the Maurice Jarre's score to A Passage uh, to India from 1980, late 1984. Uh, the last film uh, made by David Lean, the, uh, the great British film director, set in the 20s during the, the uh, period of the British Raj in India. Uh, about a multiple uh, group of characters in the city of Chandrapur, a fictional city um, in India. And it's all about the, the, the uh, from what I can tell, it's all about the British elite and the the underclass and a budding sort of friendship between two characters. It's all about racism, imperialism, um, and, and all of these these kind of big broad themes in a classic sort of David Lean package. A film that I've I have always wanted to see. Actually, I've never got around to it. But the score by Maurice Shah, who was a regular collaborator with David Lean, obviously he did like Lawrence of Arabia most significantly which is a fantastic score it's beautiful absolutely beautiful i mean it's it's a uh, apparently according to maurice yard david lean said i want you to write music right from your groin <laughs> <laughs> this, apparently this isn't a story of india it's a story of a woman i want you to write music that evokes awakening sexuality which is interesting because i it, it's not really like if you compare it to something uh, a far i suppose a far less sort of grand sweeping film but something like the um, the uh the last exotic marigold hotel by thomas newman which is actually a really nice couple of scores actually for those films and those films are quite fun actually they're quite nice but they are inflected with a lot of particularly sort of indian instrumentation and themes and things like this but a passage to india doesn't have that it's much more of a adventure score in many ways which one of the reasons i included it on this because it's maybe a slightly different kind of film to the movies we've been talking about it's not an adventure film in the same kind of context but the film that the score has a real sweep to it and a real grandeur and a real rambunctiousness that's particularly english i think and it's very much it's not scored like a film about india i don't think in a weird kind of way what did you think of this one sean yeah, I think you've hit the nail on the head there. Absolutely. It's somewhat ironically being scored by a Frenchman through an English perspective, <laughs> isn't it? It's, 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 yeah. it's a French composer filtering an English perspective about a character that's in India. It's a quite an interesting sort of cultural mix. I was mm. really glad that you that you picked this because I'd never listened to this score in isolation before. And I looked it up. It actually won the Oscar in 1984 for Best Original oh, Score, which is very interesting. Yeah, yeah. And I, um, I, 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 I really, really thrilled that you picked this because what it shows is that the, the, the 
the the term adventure score or the phrase adventure score is a nebulous one it's it's subject it can be subject to very many different interpretations and obviously what you have in the case of this is a colonial adventure it's about empire it's about expansion and how does how does an, an English citizen become witness to the to the clone to this colonial expansion? Again, I haven't seen the film. Uh, having you know, obviously David Lean, one of the most revered British filmmakers of all time, I've got an image in my head of what the film is like in terms of the presentation of the landscapes, but I haven't seen it. So I was really, really thrilled that you picked this. One of the great things about doing podcasts like this is it draws attention to scores and films that you might not otherwise have paid attention to before, and. Um, Obviously, I was familiar with Maurice Jarre's previous collaborations. Um, obviously, you know, the likes of Lawrence Arabia and Dr. Zhivago are like towering examples of what can be achieved with film music. It's very interesting going looking back at the construction of this particular score. As apparently, that well, this was David Lean's first film in 14 years. The previous film he'd made prior to this was, was Ryan's Daughter, which was, looking it up, was absolutely castigated by the critics at the time, got really, really bad reviews. And that basically scared David Lean away from making another film for 14 years, which then became a passage to India. And apparently one of the one of the one of the things that he was most cautious about in a passage to India was relying on music too much, because that was apparently one of the bugbears of critics when it came to Ryan's daughter was there was too much music in it. It was too emotionally manipulative and it was too insistent. And from what I understand in A Passage to India, Lean ended up removing most of the music that that Maurice Jarre had written. So apparently there's only 15 to 20 minutes worth of music in the movie. And apparently it ranges over, over two hours. So that's interesting. So David Lean obviously was was obviously quite queasy about the notion of the orchestral symphony guiding people's emotions. He'd clearly been so stung by the reaction to Ryan's daughter. I mean, that's that's incredible, isn't it? To think that a, a, a filmmaker of, of that stature could be cowed like that so much. I mean, it, it, it says something about the vitriol that must have greeted Ryan's daughter at the time. I, I don't, I don't get that either. And I, I'm, I'm not. Don't get me wrong. I'm not a, I'm not massively well versed in David Lean's films, but it seems, it seems really bizarre. And this, of course, I think was much better much better received and, and and maybe a much more of a fitting sort of end to his career, you know, cause he died. I think it was about five or six years later. So, you know, it's good in that sense that this was, you know, a, a more fitting film for him to go out on and with an absolutely stunning score, like absolutely stunning. I'm, I, I'm not surprised this, this, you know, um, this one basically, because I think, I think it's just fantastic. It, it's interesting because it's like you said it's not it's not the score that you would necessarily expect so looking up the construction no. of, of the main of the, the well one of the main themes Adela's themes so Adela as I understand it, is the character played by Judy Davis who is the, the person through whose eyes we see that the drama play out so the, the that is actually constructed as a foxtrot it's kind of like almost like a dance there there is there is almost like a whimsical sense of movement which is very interesting because I suppose the idea is that it's the, it almost conveys the idea of a, of a restless spirit, of a roaming spirit, somebody who wants to seek and find and sort of have new experiences. So it's it's interesting that the, the the main theme does have almost that kind of almost light hearted sense of of frolicking about it, in mixed in with the the, the standard symphonic accompaniment. And there are there are many many. The interesting that when you said there that David Lean didn't want Jar to score it in in the sense of it being an Indian score, there obviously there are many many uses of of region specific instruments all the way through the score. So I'm, I can only assume that Jar must have looked at it and thought, well, it's impossible for me to to avoid Indian yeah. instrumentation altogether. But it's done in a very very subtle way. It's not done in an overwrought manner, and there is the sound of what sounds like a theremin. At, cer- at certain points, which is not something I would have expected to have heard in the score, which gives a kind of like woozy, ethereal sense to certain tracks. It's a very, very interesting mixture. And yeah, I think the ability to stand as a sweeping adventure score, a kind of frolicking journey of self-discovery and this kind of eerie 
sense of dislocation all at once it's it's good it's it's an eccentric mixture but i but i think it works so i think it's a really interesting choice when we're talking about 80s adventure scores yeah it's it's lovely it's it's just really it's and it, it's a different way to sort of cap off this discussion i think and it'd be like you say show how varied this topic is and how you can get into all kinds of different areas with it and you know you, i mean we, you, we could spiral off and do about half a dozen different podcasts going down the rabbit holes of all these different areas that we've covered, you know, and we may well do that eventually on this show, but I think this is a great sort of general, it's going to make a cracking Spotify playlist to tell you that guys, because <laughs> this is going to be, this is going to be really good with a mixture of YouTube thrown in there. But if you, if you compi- manage to compile it all together somehow, you know, as a listen, it's going to be, it's going to be a real, a really wondrous journey. So it's been great to talk about this stuff, Sean, with you, and really pick uh, and listen to it. It's been a wonderful week for listening. I have to say, it's been such a joy doing this. It's it's been eye opening. I mean, particularly revisiting Conan the Barbarian again on that Prometheus recording, yeah. listening to the Never Ending Story in isolation, and listening to a passage to India for the first time ever. It's it's been a really mm. rich experience. Yeah, I've I've really enjoyed this one. It's been great. Well, that's great, and thanks for suggesting it. So we uh, we again know what we're doing next time. So <laughs> we'll be yeah. back. For uh, for another episode very soon, um, which is going to, I think, tie into a, a particular upcoming date, hopefully, if we can get it right. And yeah, it's been it's been really fun. So thanks for joining us for another episode. And uh, always remember, we're part of the We Made This podcast network at We Made This Pod. And uh, because the, the music of 80s adventure scores isn't the only thing that we're talking about. So we're going to give you a little taste of what else is on the network in a little moment. But... We, uh, we hope you enjoyed the playlist. We hope you enjoy the music that we've talked about. If you go off and listen to it, which I would encourage you to do. And uh, yeah, just uh, stay well. Thanks for listening. And until we see you next time, we uh, have enjoyed talking about the music with you between the notes. Elsewhere on We Made This. Frame to frame. Miraculously, we have not disagreed once on either of the tenets of these films which is extraordinary because i know it's odd to have an entire episode where we've agreed on something yeah as, as i said to you you know generally for those who are listening to this for the first time we agree in concept and diverge on nuance which is a very peculiar um situation so i never really understand why that happens but it hasn't happened I'm in a band podcast. I've got a picture of the receipt here. So we started at around midday and obviously we went on until... I mean, there was a point where he just went, you know what, I'm going to bed, boys. I'll count the back in the morning. Do you remember that? But uh, the, the picture of the bill here says 485 euros. <laughs> About four. So that... Don't say the C word. Favourite queen that has ever won. Drag Race. That has ever won Drag Race. Yeah. Jinx Monsoon. Okay, Jinx Monsoon. Well, mine is Sharon Needles. I I'm, do I'm, love Sharon Needles. I'm, I'm a kind of ageing emo goth kid in a lot of ways, and she spoke to me in a lot of ways. Why Jinx Monsoon for you? I just... I, it was the development of Jinx from the start of the series all the way through to the end. And I think it was that it was I got caught up in the journey of it and the fact that, you know, she's just fucking hilarious. Check out all of these shows and more on the We Made This podcast network. Between the Notes is produced and edited by Tony Black, who hosts alongside Sean Wilson. You can find Tony on Twitter at AJ Black Writer and Sean on Twitter at SeanO22. You can find Between the Notes on Twitter at BTW underscore notes, on iTunes, your podcast app of choice, on Spotify, Stitcher, and on Spreaker, where the show is part of the We Made This Podcast Network. For more podcasts all about TV, film, books, music, and popular culture in general, you can find We Made This on Facebook and on Twitter at We Made This Pod. Thanks for listening.